So the vehicle that we're going to talk about today is the Boyavea Machina Pecotti. So this is the BMP-1, or the first mass-produced infantry fighting vehicle. As part of Soviet doctrine in the, the late 50s, they wanted a vehicle that was highly mobile, but could also allow for the troops in the back to fire from inside the vehicle. So we have the characteristics of an armoured personnel carrier and also a light tank, so this vehicle can engage other vehicles of its comparable size with its main armament. So this vehicle came into service with the Soviet Army in 1966 and was produced right up until 1983 from specification one through to specification four. The Soviets were said to have made about 20,000 of these vehicles, although with other countries who made this vehicle under license and as well as copies, I have read a document from the US that said that there was in excess of 55,000 BMP-1s made. Now an interesting feature on the BMP-1 is the front of the hull. We're looking at about 80 degrees, so it is quite shallow. But we also have these ribs that are on the, uh, the front engine deck as well. Now the ribs were there as part of the specifications when they uh, talk about the type of fire that this vehicle can uh, withstand. So from the frontal arc it was meant to take anywhere from the 12.7, the 50 calibre, right through to the 20 and the 23 millimeter auto cannon range. So these ribs were placed on the front of the vehicle basically as a shot trap to stop these uh, rounds from ricocheting up. Now with the angle of these, they're perpendicular to the actual deck itself. So they're actually angled outwards to about an angle of 18 degrees. At their thickest, they're sitting at about uh, 10 mil. At their highest, they're sitting at about 20 mil high. We're looking at about uh, 16 millimetres of protection on the side here, at about 19 millimetres uh, underneath. I think it's about 62 degrees, but it's only about 7.1 millimetres thick uh, in this area here. The back side here tapers in, so this is an angle of about eight degrees. So depending on which position they're sitting in, they can generally have an angle of fire between about uh, 31 to about 42 degrees. So this vehicle is fully amphibious, so it can float, it can swim in water, and it can propel itself up to about eight kilometers an hour. The wheels themselves are hollow, so now we've got an air cavity, so it allows for extra buoyancy. The support arms also have an air cavity, and as we sort of come up a little bit, the side skirts, which also allow for the movement of water as well, is said to be filled with foam. For the vehicle to go through water, uh, we've got the use of a trim vane. So this is raised by the driver, so it comes up uh, into this position here. But for him to be able to see as he's driving, he removes his centre uh, periscope and he puts in a higher one so he can actually see uh, over the top. But his vision is still limited, so he is aided by the commander to assist him through uh, steering through water. We have a ventilated dome here as well, which also brings in uh, air inside the vehicle. So we fit a telescopic ventilator now, which sits just above the height of the turret. So even if water does come over the, uh, the top of the vehicle, the ventilator dome is still quite high enough to bring in fresh air without it being fouled by water. An interesting feature of the BMP is the back end being the doors. So within both sides of the doors, they actually carry diesel fuel. So the thickness on the outer plate is about 13 millimetres and the thickness on the inner plate is about five millimetres. So this holds about 55 litres. The right door holds about 67 litres. So a combined total within the doors themselves about 122 litres. Combined with the internal tank here, we hold in excess uh, of about 462 litres. This gave it a, a very good range. They had uh, very good uh, fuel capacity with these. And even into BMP2, we look at additional internal tanks as well. So it did give it a very good range and they could operate, you know, you sort of, you're talking about that three day mark on the internal fuel. Uh, the crew can actually see the amount of litres uh, written on the standpipe as well. So it gives a, a crew a good indication of how much fuel is left in the vehicle. <coughs> these ports here, one for each firer. So these three here, we fit uh, sort of that AK series of rifles. Each port has a rotating uh, functionality here where we can move the rifle. So to do that, this is pulled out. This fits around the barrel and it slots back in there. We also have a cover here. So when we fire the rifle, all the rounds are deflected down uh, away from any other crewman. 
We also have a ventilation system. So when we fire the rifle, we've got gases. So those gases are expelled to outside the vehicle. They've got their own periscopes, which can move up and down a little bit. We also have this ventilation system here as well. So air is brought inside the vehicle and we can see the, the little outlets here. So this will pump out cool air onto the, the face of the occupant inside. And it can also act as a heater as well in the uh, cold environments. The front crewman up here on both sides has the PKT 7.62 machine gun. So he can also fire this machine gun from inside the vehicle and he's mainly pointed uh, forward. And I think this one has a field of view of about 42 degrees. You wouldn't want to be firing too much from inside this vehicle because the vehicle is a magnet for uh, any tank weapons. So for the, the Soviets, they would essentially want to drop between three to 400 meters from uh, the area that they're assaulting, so the crew would actually be out, because otherwise the closer you get, the more vulnerable you are to uh, any tank uh, weapons. So I'd hate to be inside this vehicle um, if you're in an area that uh, you know there's uh, any tank weapons around. So this vehicle carries the 73mm low pressure 2A28 Grom. So this is a smoothbore weapon and this fires the uh, PG-15V heat round. So it carries 40 rounds in all in this uh, rack uh, to my right and it is loaded by a semi-mechanical auto loader. So this has a rate of fire of about eight rounds per minute. So this warhead, the heat warhead, is able to penetrate anywhere from uh, about sort of 280 millimeters up to about 350 millimeters of armor. So it still was able to engage MBT, so your M60, uh, your leopard and be able to said to be able to penetrate the uh, the frontal armor of them. So the gun was actually still quite good. Specification three in 1974 added the HE frag. So this is the OG 15 round. Now we have a mixture of about 24 heat to about 16 HE frag rounds. Now the HE round is a very low velocity round. It was said that they wouldn't want to fire sort of anything over a thousand meters because they had a very high trajectory, curved trajectory. With this vehicle, because the gun was not stabilized, you had to stop to shoot. Um, so you wouldn't want to be engaging anything over that uh, thousand meters, but the heat round uh, could fire ineffectively out to about uh, three kilometers. With heat and HESH, because they're a chemical energy round, penetration properties unaffected by distance, say like uh, APDS. So a good armament to have, although I wouldn't be uh, trying to get too close to any other MBT, but a, a vehicle comparative in size, you'd uh, definitely use this uh, armament. From the firing position, sitting in the, in the gunner seat, so he has his controls that he can uh, elevate and traverse the gun, uh, coupled with his uh, one PN22 M2 day-night sight. You also have the PKT machine gun, the 7.62. And as we sort of look down, we have two containers located here. So they, each container holds 1,000 rounds, and they are joined together, so it holds 2,000 rounds of 7.62. So in conjunction with the main armament on this vehicle, we also have an anti-tank guided munition. So the, this is the 9M14, the Malutka. Um, commonly known by NATO as the AT-3 Saga. We carry four of these missiles. The AT-3 Saga is a wire-guided uh, munition. The gunner needs to fire about 2,300 simulations to be able to get control of this weapon because from about zero to 500 meters, it takes that long for the gunner to actually get control of the missile in flight. Uh, from there, he can engage targets out to about uh, 3,000 meters. Now, in order for the gunner to do this, just by my left leg is a little handle located here. If we pull that up, is his control function here. So this is his little joystick. And this is what he gets control of the missile with. So he will guide this onto the target um, using, using this control. So it takes uh, generally out to about 3,000 meters. It sort of takes well over 10 seconds to get uh, to the target. So he's got to remain locked on, looking through his sight, following that trail of smoke uh, onto the target. So this is where the missile would actually sit. So you can uh, elevate the gun and then push the missile here and put it on its rail. You're in the commander's position. Okay. Um, so he, he operates the, uh, the radio. Uh, this is the, uh, the 123M. So this has a frequency range of about uh, 20 megahertz or up to about 50, 
6.5 megahertz, I think. So it does cover both sort of that HF and VHF range. You can get sort of from about 16 to, to 50 kilometers of, of range out of this radio. So this is the driver's position. As part of the specifications, they wanted a vehicle that was highly mobile, fast. This vehicle can get up to about 55 kilometers an hour. Like with most Soviet vehicles, it is a manual vehicle, so it does have a clutch. The gear lever is located just here, so it is a five-speed manual, so it's in uh, H pattern. We have our steering bar across the top. Now this vehicle is very responsive when you, you turn it. This is a gyroscopic compass, so it can actually uh, give the driver heading that he can actually drive on when he's closed down. When he's closed down, he has uh, these three vision blocks and I think that gives him from memory a degree of vision of about 120 degrees. Uh, but again, he's reliant on the commander uh, to be able to uh, guide him in, in the direction that it needs to go in, but he can use that compass as an aid. I think with its design characteristics, it was a very effective vehicle. So this operated obviously as part of the uh, motor rifle regiment within the Soviet army. If you want to ride in this vehicle and have that experience of uh, what it was like inside, it is available for Ozama Fest 2023.